I would like to welcome you all on uh, our online event, uh, CCFG Live. It is the first time that uh, we, as a cultural creators friendship group, reach out to the broader public with a live event. With us today, uh, we have 12 members of the European Parliament who are active in the CCFG. We are especially delighted to have the European Commissioner for Culture with us today. Maria Gabriel will join us later on. And we're extremely happy that uh, more than 150 participants from all over Europe registered for our event. On behalf of the CCFG, I uh, would like to welcome you all and thank you for the interest. My name is Alex Georgiulis. I am a Greek MEB uh, from uh, the GUNGL group, and I'm also an actor and a writer. So, I will be your moderator for today's event. Allow me to give you a short overview on, uh, on what can expect this morning. Firstly, we will talk about the Cultural Creators Friendship Group, our CCFG. Secondly, there will be the main part, the main panel with Commissioner Maria Gabriel. And thirdly, we will, uh, we will be, there will be, um, a Q&A session. I'm sure you will have many questions uh, for us today. We have already collected many questions as well from you uh, while you were um, registering uh, prior to our event. It would, uh, if you would like to submit uh, questions uh, now during the event, please submit your questions in the Q&A session as well as the recipient of your question. If there is time, uh, we will try to, uh, to answer to all the questions, but uh, if not, you will receive uh, a written reply in due time. We will try to answer all questions today, but uh, we will be to, with you uh, later, uh, on a later stage to uh, answer all questions as possible. Of course, if you're active on uh, social media, please use the hashtag CCFG Live, CCFG, and uh, Cultural Creators. So, we are ready to begin. We would like to start with uh, showing you a short video that uh, we made before summer. We are the Cultural Creators Friendship Group. We. We, we, we are the members of the Culture Creators Friendship Group. We declare that we urge and we call European Parliament, the European Commission, and member states to double the budget for the Creative Europe. Provide at least 1% for culture across the multi-annual financial framework budget. Include cultural and creative sectors in the recovery plan. Earmark for culture a certain percentage of the recovery plan. To target to cultural and creative sectors the additional funds stemming from the Next Generation EU initiative. Grant based support to the CCS. To reach out to micro organizations and individual artists who are struggling to be back on the track after the pandemic crisis. Uh, to safeguard and further promote the survival and development of cultural creative sectors. And to consider freelancers and self-employed as professionals in the culture and creative sectors. We, 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 we put culture where it belongs. At the heart of our political focus. In our hearts and in the focus of politics. At the heart of our political focus. Pour la culture. Für Kultur. Pour la culture. Für Kultur. Für Kultur. Za Kultura. Et un politismo. All right. Now I would like uh, to ask on stage my dear colleague, MEP Nicholas Neines. Nicholas initiated the CCFG from uh, more than uh, one year ago, and we are all glad that we are members of this uh, friendship group. Nicholas. Hello, thank you, Alexis. Hi, Nick. How are you? How are you today? I'm fine, thank you very much. Nicholas, can you tell us how did you come up with uh, this uh, idea for the CCFG? 
Um, well, you already mentioned it was a year ago, and a year ago was basically uh, our all election um, into Parliament. Um, and so I had a very early on a meeting uh, with Nicole Schulz from AEPO Artis and Cecilia Springer from SAA. And um, they told me that um, we had a great intergroup working uh, last time. However, the focus was a little bit missing for the um, for the creators and the authors. And so I being myself, you know, um, started out as a singer and started out as a um, as an actor. I wanted to to um, get involved into the situation of authors and creators, and therefore I asked to see um, to integrate a subject section into the CCI, um, and we agreed on that and wanted to do that. However, sadly, um, the CCI did not work out as an intergroup, and after that, after the shock that it didn't work out. Um, we all, I mean, we talked previously already, uh, Alexis um, and all the other members already um, on how to do it and uh, to support creators and authors. And then we thought, okay, without the intergroup, how, what can we do? And then we said, well, if we don't have an intergroup, um, let's do a, a friendship group then. Um, the cause is still there. It's still important to talk about these issues. It cannot be that there's no intergroup or a construct in the parliament uh, considering culture and the arts. And therefore, um, we uh, we came together and um, it took some time um, to, to bring everything together, to work it out. Then Corona hit and we had a big uh, issue at hand, especially for the cultural sector. But now um, we're in a good working mood and I'm very happy to uh, see this very first um, this very first event happening to present ourselves to show a little bit what we want to do in what direction we want to go and to start um, the work with uh, the organizations and to start the work uh, or increase the work um, for the culture and creative sector. Thank you very much, Nicholas. As Nicholas explained, a group of authors and performers organizations had expressed their wish to, for something like the CCFG uh, to come into existence. So now I'd like uh, to invite two persons on stage who played a crucial role in the initiative, in this initiative. Nicole Sulz from IPO Artists and Cecile De Springer from the Society of Audiovisual, Audiovisual Authors. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexis. Um, yes, uh, AIPO Artis really very much welcomes the support uh, and creation of the uh, CCFG. Um, we're very grateful for your dedication and energy turning the political focus back to authors and performers. And I think Niklas has already um, very aptly described the process. So we had in the past the uh, CCI, the industry intergroup, uh, um, which has done tremendous work in highlighting the importance of the sector um, as a pillar of the EU economy, um, in terms of revenue, in terms of employment, but performers face very specific issues and we very much needed a different platform where these could be discussed and receive necessary attention. So we're very grateful for the CCFG initiative. And I would like to give you an example um, why this group is really so important to us looking at the streaming market. And of course, um, very early on, there was a discussion on um, the revenues and how they are divided between the different players. And I know the CCFG has been already very involved in the discussion, but I'd like to just say that um, it's been it's not a new debate and uh, already in 2008 with an impact assessment the commission on the term of protection the commission recognized the great majority of performers are forced to accept contractual conditions that only give them a single lump sum payment so finally we are here with article 18 and the copyright directive which really obliges member states to ensure performers and authors receive proportionate remuneration from all exploitations and it was uh, it, well, it has to be said the parliament who fought relentlessly for authors and performers in this this regard and it is a great opportunity now that this article is being implemented um, and of course, much depends on the member states, how it will be implementing and whether it will 
generate uh, revenues for performers. But I wanted to highlight that it took us 12 years to get here, 12 years. And we discussed this already before 2008, when the first impact assessment mentioned the issue, 12 years. So we don't really have another 12 years. So we really need to have the political focus on how to improve the situation of authors and performers in the various aspects. And it shows also the importance the parliament has in this process and what you've already achieved for us. Um, I would like to maybe just come back to the support uh, the um, authors, performers and um, cultural workers uh, organization uh, um, provided to the uh, idea of having a group in the parliament. Um, supportive of, of the creators. Um, the European Parliament has always been supportive of the creators. Uh, it's not a, a new story. Um, and if you compare with the European Commission, the, the, the support is always uh, better in, in the European Parliament. There is a, this sensitivity for cultural, um, is cultural issues in the Parliament. Um, but back in uh, 2019, when the, the uh, election took place, um, the, um, the, the, the new legislative period uh, was seen by a creators' organization uh, like um, a possible uh, difficult period because we were um, finishing a very intense uh, legislative period in terms of legislation, if you remember. So, the two directives on copyright have been adopted, uh, the audiovisual media services directive have been adopted, and there was the fear that uh, um, nobody would care anymore about um, cultural um, and creative um, yeah. sectors and the um, creators themselves. Uh, so 12 organizations, so it's not just Nicole uh, and I, 12 organizations representing uh, um, authors, performers, and other creators called the European Parliament to um, continue working on uh, uh, the specific uh, needs and go into more details into what uh, authors, performers, and other creators need um, and, and to go to, to start a reflection on what can we do uh, in this um, period where there is the need to implement the directive, of course, and it's important to implement them um, uh, to the best, uh, uh, to the benefit of the um, authors and performers, of course, but also what um, the European Parliament can initiate in terms of uh, uh, thinking, uh, in terms of uh, um, um, giving visibility to uh, good practices, and also to identify the lacks um, the lack of uh, protection uh, for um, authors, uh, performers, and other creators. So that's why this um, uh, organization called for um, an entry group uh, to be set up uh, and um, supportive of the uh, cultural and creative sectors, but also having a special attention for, for the need of the creators. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, I think the focus was really to, to take this uh, legislative period uh, um, as a, um, a moment of reflection and having uh, a, a very deep focus um, on the special needs of um, authors and performers. Thank you very much, uh, Cecile, for your uh, input. And uh, now how about you, uh, Nicole? Um, as a representative of uh, performers, uh, what were and are your expectations regarding the CCFG? Um, as as uh, Cecile already said, it's really to keep uh, um, the focus on authors and performers and uh, after the heavy discussion of the copyright directive to really um, um, continue looking at uh, what are the gaps in protection um, and uh, what, you know, where that need to be filled and, and what can the parliament do um, to improve the situation. And um, uh, so and the working plan that you've presented has already a great number of um, important issues. It's very comprehensive and um, there are many important discussions to be had. I think um, we would we would welcome also, of course, as an organization uh, representing um, 
uh, collective management organizations for performers to um, engage in the in discussion on uh, the dynamics um, collective management organizations have for performers, what they can bring to the table, how they can ensure fair remuneration. Um, because, of course, um, uh, in, in the current system, exclusive rights are very important and they remain so. But in a situation where performers are uh, the weaker negotiating party, what else can we do? And remuneration rights can make the difference um, because uh, they remain in the hands of performers. So um, I think we can uh, do a lot more work to look into that. Um, there are uh, various studies in, in the pipeline for the Commission with regards to collective management. So I think there are a lot of important discussions to be had. Also, um, there are still a number of inequalities um, in the protection, for instance, um, with regards to uh, the term of protection, uh, where we have, um, since 2011, um, an extension of term for sound recordings, but not for audiovisual performance. I mean, maybe you can help us there, Alexis, but I didn't think musicians were living longer than our actors. So um, there were def definitely a, a number of, of uh, gaps that are still needing to be filled that we need to discuss. And as I said, the working plan is really an excellent starting point and indeed very comprehensive. Um, and we cannot wait, um, uh, you know, it's, it's for you, we're looking for you to drive forward some of those important issues like you have with Article 18. Um, and similarly, uh, there was also the Beijing Treaty, which was adopted uh, in 2012, and yet the EU has still not ratified it. So there are really uh, a, a number of issues that um, we, we are hoping you will be able to put on the political agenda and drive them forward um, for authors and performers. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. Uh, you are giving us a clear uh, picture. Yeah, uh, now, Cecile. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes so, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, Cecile, if you look ahead, what would you say uh, are the most important issues for authors and performers to come uh, in 2021 uh, in terms of legislation, but also on another current uh, um, on other current um, challenges such as uh, COVID-19 urgencies or uh, streaming aspects? Thank you. Um, if I look back at what we put in our joint paper of the 12 organization, uh, in spite of the COVID-19 crisis uh, uh, happening this year, I would uh, maintain all the requests uh, we put on this paper because the COVID-19 crisis uh, has just um, uh, strengthened uh, the, the impact of uh, underlying problems uh, that uh, exist in the cultural and creative uh, uh, sectors for um, creative people. Uh, so the lack of um, social protection, the lack of a status, the very uh, unstable uh, revenue streams for, uh, for the creators. Uh, this instability is uh, very much, <laughs> uh, it was already there, but it has been accelerated uh, by, the, um, by the crisis and uh, the needs are even uh, more um, important today uh, to address um, all these issues. Uh, what also the, the crisis has uh, accelerated is the um, uh, importance of um, uh, online uh, streaming platforms, VOD platforms in the consumption habits of uh, European uh, citizens and the um, inadequacy of the uh, remuneration structure of authors um, and performers in this, um, in this context. Uh, there are, I mean, the majority of um, authors and performers have their remuneration completely disconnected to the reality of the consumption of their works. Uh, in, in, in my case, the audiovisual authors, they are only in a few countries where they receive royalties for the uh, exploitation of their works by on-demand uh, platforms. So all these issues 
Uh, some of them um, can potentially be addressed by the, the new directives. Uh, so the monitoring and of the implementation of the new directive, the three of them, the two copyright directive and the audiovisual media services directive are really important uh, for, for, for the whole sector. <clears throat> And the COVID-19 crisis delayed very much this implementation uh, process. <clears throat> and uh, we really count on the European Parliament to be very uh, vigilant and uh, scrutinizing this, uh, this implementation uh, process so that they deliver really uh, for, for the cultural and creative sectors, whether in terms of uh, investment and promotion of um, European works by um, on-demand platforms, uh, but also uh, in terms of um, um, fair remuneration for authors and performers when their works are exploited online or on any other media. So I would say that um, um, the, the COVID-19 crisis delayed a bit um, all this, but the, the challenges are, are, were already there before and, and, and still need uh, to be addressed even more urgently today. Um, the friendship group is not uh, exactly an intergroup, uh, as we already said, but uh, from what I can see, uh, I mean, you already, uh, you have already done a lot uh, that in these difficult times uh, that I would not have uh, expected. So I think no matter uh, the, the format of your, of your group, what is important is that it's a uh, across political um, groups. Uh, you, you're a group of MEPs from all horizons in terms of politics and countries. And uh, um, in addition to the normal works in the culture committee, in the industry committee, in the internal market committee, in the legal affairs committee, your conversation, your discussion, and, and, um, and this group uh, can be very, very useful um, mm -hmm. for the cultural and creative sectors. Thank you very much, uh, Cecil, for your input and um, for explaining your expectations from uh, CCFG. Uh, I would like to say, uh, on behalf of the CCFG, that uh, we really uh, want to do our best. Uh, we love and we respect culture, so we will give as much as possible for the best for the culture. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Um, we, as the CCFG, can only succeed when we have the support from you all, from stakeholders, cultural associations, and individual people working on the cultural and creative uh, sectors. Now, let's have a quick look at uh, our CCFG manifesto and uh, the CCFG working plan. In our manifesto, we have uh, defined four objectives that uh, we want to follow. As you can see, uh, as you can see them now on uh, the screen, our keywords are awareness raising, networking, and building a legislation framework. And then we have our six uh, main areas of work. Uh, let me mention that uh, if you're interested uh, in reading the whole manifesto or become a supporter, please check our website, culturalcreators.eu. But now let's have a closer look at the six main areas of work that we have uh, specified in our working plan and we are aiming to. First, it would be labor side, social and working conditions, then funding and supporting creativity. Uh, the third um, would be cultural education in lifelong learning and career development. Fourth, opportunities and uh, challenges of the digital area. Fifth, uh, promoting the European dimension of cultural diversity. Uh, 
And last but not least, fostering international cultural relations at EU level. We will do our best to cover these issues as much as possible in uh, the CCFG. So we are happy that uh, in the CCFG, there are now more than 20 members of the European Parliament from six different political groups uh, from uh, 13 different countries. Now, um, let's see some of the objectives that we have already taken as the CC of G. Allow me now to invite MEP Romeo Franz to make to take the floor. Good morning, Alexis. Good morning. How are you? So fine, fine, Alexis. Can we explain some more about the actions of our CCFG regarding the budget for culture that mm -hmm. uh, we saw in the video a few minutes before? Yes. Dear Alexis and dear members and friends, thank you for this introduction and the reflection and this input so far. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this cultural and creative friendship group because we are a cross-party parliamentary group with MEP, who are aiming the same ideas about the importance of culture, especially in regards of the huge challenges that the cultural sector is facing with the COVID-19 pandemic, where so many creators and cultural institutions are heavily affected, we need to strengthen this sector with financial means and to invest. In this sense, our CCFG group, we initiate a statement in September to claim for more financial means. I'm satisfied that our demands to increase the budget for the next financial term, 2021 to 2027, has been reflected and the Creative Euro program will receive a 35% increase of its budget. Thank you very much. I am my musician and I have lived out of my music for years. Culture is our soul of Europe. It reflects our diversity and cultural richness and is the best tool to foster intercultural dialogue and to combat racism, which unfortunately is rising in our societies. Now I will stop here and I'm very much looking forward to our discussions today especially with Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Romeo. Uh, now let's now ask uh, MEP Nicholas Nines about the Save EU Culture Campaign. Nicholas. Yes. Can you tell us um, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, about the, the Save EU Culture Campaign. Uh, can you tell us anything, something about this campaign? Sure. Um, so the, the thing was that um, in the very beginning of the COVID crisis, we very soon anticipated that this crisis will hit the cultural sector uh, the hardest because the first things to close were cultural institutions, um, stages, etc. Um, and the, we all know that they are also um, the last ones to open. This also goes into the direction of sport and so far. Um, but we knew that um, this crisis, the COVID crisis, will have a huge effect on the whole sector. And we need sustainable um, support for creators as soon as possible. Um, because we also know that because of the um, way that the social security net works or not works, and the way of remuneration work, um, we'll have a deep problem because a lot of um, creators don't have so much of, um, of fallback options. And so that's why we started this, um, this uh, campaign uh, in which we um, had a petition um, uh, which, we, which we introduced to all of Europe and got uh, several 
um, uh, signatures, uh, several thousand signatures for it. And we also delivered a, um, a paper and a, um, and a letter to all the heads of states and the culture, the ministers for culture uh, in the member states, as well as to the commission president to take immediate action. Um, and I, even though we, um, we did not completely succeed in that time, I still have the feeling that at least what we, what we made possible was to bring more people together. And at the moment we are seeing actually that the issue is more understood the more we talk about it. It really took some time to take off, but at least now I see more and more posts, um, also actually heads of state and ministers of culture talking about it. It's still quite fr frustrating because um, when we had the, the uh, German presidency coming to the cult um, committee, um, the German um, minister for culture, Ms. Kutter, um, actually asked us to deliver more money, so the parliament to deliver more money for the cultural sector, when we really all know that the, that the ones deciding on the budget in the RRF, for example, uh, are the member states. And so it was, it was frustrating to see that, that uh, they have not yet understood it, but I think we have done several work in this regard to make them understand. And there was the Save EU Culture um, campaign, and we're still um, doing it at the moment to, to continue to the work and to continue to ensure that people know about the sustainable crisis of the cultural creative sector. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, indeed, the whole situation is uh, very frustrated and uh, we really need to uh, support in essence. Perhaps we could discuss some more about uh, the recovery and the resilience facility. Um, you, uh, were with other MEPs fighting for the 2% earmarking for the cultural and creative uh, sectors. I remember that negotiation where you and I, we were asking for 7%, knowing that uh, this is uh, extremely high, but uh, without raising the stakes that much, we wouldn't have the 2% that we have now. Please, Nicholas, uh, tell us um, something about it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. So I think the initial um, report was done by the Renew Group, and there was Laurence Ferrand, um, who started the um, the um, resolution of culture in the in a crisis um, as a resolution for the Parliament, and she did a great draft. Uh, the only thing for missing for for you and me, Alexis, was the question of how much do we want to support of the RF um, to the to the um, CCS. And um, I know that in the CCFG, we had the argumentation of 7%. 7% is quite high because we know that only, um, I think, 4% of the GDP has been delivered of the culture and creative sector. But my logic in this sentence was uh, not so much to increase the stakes, but if we want to help out a struggling, um, a struggling um, um, sector, then we don't just need to invest as much as it is contributing to the GDP, but to kickstart it and therefore give it even more. Um, but then, of course, and there was a very good um, discussion with all the other um, with all the other uh, MEPs that were working on this, the shadows from the other groups. Um, we still have to recognize that there are other um, sectors that also need support, and therefore seven percent. While it may be justified, um, it's a little bit too much for this existential crisis that's not just affecting the cultural sector, but affecting it mainly. Um, so uh, that we discussed it and then we ended up with the 2% in the resolution, which is still very great and um, uh, was a great step. And then we took it a step further and said, okay, this is the resolution. We then asked um, everybody to sign an amendment for the RF that we delivered to the budget committee. And we had um, and also, I'm very grateful that uh, it shows that this intergroup works because we brought together all the people who were working on this text from all the groups, and we we got support from six different uh, groups for, for this amendment. We tabled it with six people, and we delivered it to the RRF to uh, have 2% dedicated to the CCS. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicholas. Now, um, let's also speak about uh, our open uh, letter to the EU Commission and the Member States demanding effective implementation of Article 18 of the European Union Copyright Directive 
regarding uh, guaranteeing um, the fair remuneration of authors and performers for the use of their work on streaming services. And uh, let us show you our short video to promote exactly that. Mm, maybe we have a technical problem. I can't hear you. Would you mind? Yes. We, 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 the members of the Cultural Creators Friendship Group, we underline that the COVID-19 pandemic reminds us how important it is to strengthen the situation of authors and performers in Europe. To ensure that they can effectively earn a living from the art, especially from the ever-growing digital market. Fought very hard in recent years for a positive change that would guarantee exactly that. In 2019, after long negotiations, EU Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market was adopted. It's now up to the Member States to put in place the necessary mechanisms to ensure that remuneration is paid to authors and performers. The European Parliament stands fully behind this provision. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated how fragile the current system is and how much this provision is needed. We, the members of the CCFG, we call on the European Commission and member states to... ...to take immediate action, guaranteeing the effective implementation of Article 18. The effective implementation of Article 18. Article 18. Article 18. Action now. Il faut agir maintenant. Action y ahora. Action. A teraz do dzieła. Dzielimy sada, okrenimy se. Jetzt handeln, gehen wir an. Auf geht's. Vrasi dora. Action now. This is, uh, that was uh, the video that we did for Article uh, 18. Um, and so um, uh, we have to apologize about uh, these technical uh, issues. So this was it so far uh, for the introductory session. If you have any questions, please uh, write them uh, in the Q uh, session of this uh, Zoom conference. Artists need to get paid for what they deserve. Um, now, here we are in the main session of this event. We have the honor to have with us Commissioner Maria Gabriel. Commissioner, we are looking forward to joining forces for culture because following your words, culture is Europe's soul. We are very glad to hear that. Thank you very much for your presence here today, and the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting of Cultural Creators Friendship Group. First of all, I'm very glad that this friendship group has been created. You have my full support. And the more groups and entities we have to promote and defend the interests of sectors, the better it is. Well, I would like to start by saying again that culture is indeed at the center of our lives. I want to start by thanking the European Parliament for your constant commitment and support. Your active involvement was crucial to secure a substantial top-up for the next Creative Europe program. Thanks to the additional 600 million euros, the program can really reach the biggest budget ever. Now, I think that we are better equipped to achieve the objectives of the program and at the same time to mitigate the extremely negative impact of COVID-19. As we are finalizing the negotiations, I would like to thank the Rapporteur and the negotiating team of the European Parliament for the progress made over the past weeks. We'll meet on trilogue in a few days with the aim to reach an agreement 
so that the new program can be operational as of January 2021. And the new Creative Europe program will ensure first continuity of successful actions. At the same time, we'll include some important novelties. And let me stress three of them. First, a new cross-border mobility scheme for artists and cultural professionals as a follow-up to the successful pilot scheme ePortunus. Second, new support for, for specific sectoral needs, including the music sector, building on the implementation of the preparatory action Music Moves Europe, the architecture, cultural heritage, as well as the book sector. All these are support for sectoral needs. Third, the reinforcement of the competitiveness of the sector in line with creative innovation labs. And this last point will link very well with the new instruments that will support the sector notably through Horizon Europe program. Now for the first time in Horizon Europe program, we'll have a new cluster on culture, creativity and the inclusive society. At the same time, together with the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, we'll create a new KIC knowledge and innovation community on cultural and creative industries. And the idea here is to look at the sector as an ecosystem in line with the 14 industrial ecosystems that we have identified, and one of which is on cultural and creative industries. Thanks to you, Horizon Europe also has received a substantial additional top-up of 4 billion euros. The same for Erasmus Plus and its 2.2 billion. Erasmus Plus will also play its part. You know that during the summer, we launched an extraordinary call, Partnerships for Creativity, to connect education, training, youth, and the cultural and creative sectors. And in the near future, I will focus my work on creating synergies, synergies among all these different types of support. Let us not forget, forget that there are more. Culture can be included as beneficiary of ReactEU, InvestEU, Digital Euro program and cohesion funds. And it is in line that I have worked jointly with the president of the Committee of the Regions on a joint action plan for the next two years. I think that it will be up to us all to transform this joint action plan in something tangible with concrete benefits for cultural and creative sectors in all our regions. We presented this plan last week and the role of our regions are fundamental in the use of funds, but they need to be involved from the beginning to know the opportunities offered to them. And precisely because all our opportunities are not well known, I'm working to revamp our website and provide a guidance note on financing possibilities for the sector. My wish would be to include the same guidance note also on the Creatives Unite platform. These are all issues I raised on Tuesday during the informal video conference of the Ministers of Culture. And I, here I also underlined your resolution on last September and your call to earmark 2% for culture from the Recovery and Resilience Facility. I want to thank you for this strong message. I know that you are in contact with your colleagues in the European Parliament in charge of the negotiations. The crisis has shown that we need to rethink our interaction with the sector to find innovative ways to support it. And I'm thinking here about one another example. I'm talking about the alternative sources of funding. In this sense, initiatives such as the Culture of Solidarity Fund are interesting and we should explore possible ways to support them. Looking specifically at cultural heritage, we have included this topic of alternative sources of financing in our work plan for culture for 2019-2020 and we'll hold a workshop on this topic at the beginning of next year. We need to engage the sector and the citizens in all our initiatives to turn them into societal and cultural projects. And here, again, examples. First, I think about the Conference of the Future of Europe. 
I cannot see a better way to get citizens involved in a wide ranging debate of Europe's future in the coming decade and beyond than through culture. For instance, via theater or performing arts or debates in museums. Second, the new Bauhaus movement, a bridge between on one hand science and technology and culture and art on the other. And the contribution of the sector is very important, especially now as we are in the first design phase. Third, the European Green Deal. To make it a success, it needs to be turned into a cultural project, engaging and empowering our citizens. Only the culture could achieve this. Well, to sum up, more fundings from our instruments, more instruments than before, more synergies to be created, the need to look at other initiatives, the need to engage more with the sectors and citizens, and finally, the key role of the European Parliament. These were my main messages today. I know I can count on you, know that you can count on me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Gabriel. It was an um, insightful sp speech um, for sharing with us uh, the, the initiatives the, that the Commission is working on the field of the culture, uh, which are the key of a present and um, a future of the audience that join us uh, today. As uh, it was mentioned earlier, uh, this yeah. cultural. Sorry? Oh, I was hearing somewhere. Uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I going, going on, the Cultural Creators Friendship Group is a cross party coalition that operates within the European Parliament with the aim of improving the whole European cultural e ecosystem and especially the situation and co conditions of creators, which is uh, precis precisely what we want to tackle in the next panel discussion the current situation of the cultural uh, creators. Uh, aside uh, from continuing uh, having the honor to have uh, the Commissioner Gabriel among us, at this point, I would like to welcome to this conversation two very dear colleagues of mine. Nicolas Ninas is well known uh, already, uh, is uh, one of the uh, foundators of this cultural friendship group, is uh, part, uh, active part of the, the cult committee on the European Parliament is a shadow reporter in Creative Europe and in European Sol Solidarity Corps. And uh, as you know, is uh, an active member in support of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this sector. Uh, Lawrence Farrand uh, is uh, a very committed MEP as well with the Renew uh, Europe Group. She is no other than the coordinator of the political family in the CULT Committee. Her involvement in cultural issues have been reflected in her contributions to the European Parliament resolution on cultural recovery, as well as reporter for the European Parliament report on the effective measures to green Erasmus Plus, Creative Europe and the European Solidarity Corps. So on, uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, to three, uh, all three, uh, some uh, questions and uh, uh, later we'll have uh, the chance to to uh, com complete even uh, these these visions with another additional uh, questions. And I'm I'm going to to start with with uh, the reflection that member states should be drafting uh, their own national plans, which will need to detail detail how they intend to spend the funds. This relates uh, not only to the multi-annual uh, multi budget uh, 21, 2021 and 2027, but especially to the recovery fund, uh, Next Generation EU, which is worth six, uh, 750 billion euros. I'd like to, to ask to Commissioner Gabriel, more or less five, five minutes, could you tell us how the European Commission is going to coordinate with member states to complete the national recovery and resilience plans by April 2021. The floor is yours.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this for this question. Well, first of all, as you already underlined, it's a national it's a national responsibility. So all our member states are working on their national strategies, but we know that we have big priorities and they, their national strategies should be aligned with these priorities. And what I can see that here we have a momentum to continue to raise this message to our member states in order to be sure that cultural and creative sectors will be included in their national strategies. What I'm talking about, look at, at, at the moment. First, we need to, to be sure that in, our, in the national strategies, at least there will be 20% for policies linked to the digitalization. Of course, that here we can support cultural and creative sectors. We all have seen during the crisis how digital content is increased and we need to protect our creators and our artists. So that's one of one of the messages. We have 30, 37% for the Green Deal. And that's not a hazard that I mentioned the Bauhaus movement because cultural and creative sectors are really the driver for, for, for this if you'd like to see it realized and if you'd like to see it spread in all our member states. So now it's really up, up to them. That's why what, what we can and what we are doing until now, it's first to be sure that the national strategies are aligned with these big priorities, digitalization, green deal, economy that works for people. After to be to be sure that with all our ministers we are on the same the same line. Now the question here for me is what are the, the main two, three big projects where we can join forces with all our member states and where we can really uh, mobilize our forces in order to see them, to see them uh, implemented. I'm thinking that, of course, we should continue to exchange information and, and um, good practices, but definitely we, we, we should promote the idea of European cultural heritage cloud. It's a huge time now to, to, to have it. We need to, 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 to look a little bit more about the protection of our artists and our, our, our creators. That's not a hazard that we are making a study about the statute. And I know this question is very important in our, in our member states. But for the moment, we stay very open for the arrival of these strategies. I think that in parallel, what we should continue to do is to stay united to stay mobilized because let's 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 say that the the sector is extraordinarily diverse it's a strength but it's a weakness too so we need really to to make more efforts to stay united to stay mobilized to speak with one voice and to insist again that there is no sustainable recovery there is no future resilience in Europe if culture and creative sectors are not at the center and at the heart of the future policies. And we have extraordinary examples during the crisis we have seen. We have previous experiences. Now what will be important is to create synergies and to see how with the different funding we can join forces and we can have more impact. And it's not a hazard that I talk about the committee of the regions, because with the joint action plan that we decided for the next two years, two years, not five, not 10, that's an occasion, that's an opportunity for us to see how with the European Regional Development Fund, we can help the sector. Do you know that a cohesion fund, at least 30% is used for innovation? Cultural and creative sectors can be the driver of the innovation in Europe. So now what we, we need really to, to do is speak with one voice and assure of very close follow up about synergies, this time creating them and not only talking about them and next about their implementation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. We look forward for your leadership in this uh, collective uh, bargain that we have to to, to, to make uh, in next uh, months. I'm, I'm going to, to, to pass to, to my colleague, uh, Lorenz Farran. I'd like to, 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 to ask uh, her, uh, collective management organization have it, it existed since the 18th uh, century, you, you know very well in, in France, indeed. They provide authors with an efficient co and cost effective way to manage the rights around the world, to ensure that the works 
uh, are used in accordance with governing laws and also rely on uh, this collective management organization to exercise their profession. My question is, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence in, in five minutes more or less as well, what do you think uh, of mandatory collective management as the way to, for ensuring the remuneration for performance? Thank you, Iban. Well, it, uh, sorry. Lawrence, sorry. <laughs> Um, first of all, uh, good morning, Madam uh, Commissioner, dear Maria, hello to my colleagues and friends. Uh, if I may, I would like uh, to say a short word uh, to react to what uh, Mrs. Gabrielle said. I think it's very important that we, have this, that we have this kind of exchanges. We have very frequent exchanges with you, and I think it's a good way of working. We have a lot to do and to achieve. And uh, this time of uh, crisis of pandemic, I think it's really an opportunity to change and to, to make great progress for culture. Um, as you said, there are many things very interesting that you have uh, told. Thank you uh, to have uh, raised our resolution for culture. Uh, this is an important step that uh, parliament has made to raise culture at uh, 87% of the MEP have, have voted this resolution. Uh, with this intergroup is um, as well a very important uh, initiative. And I thank uh, Niklas Ninas because he has worked a lot with uh, all our colleagues. It's a very important thing we are here. We are raising this point uh, and this uh, issue. Um, and I think the, we, we will have a great victory when culture will not uh, always link to uh, other issues like uh, greening, uh, uh, what you have said, uh, digital. It's a wall. It's a, it's a, it's a thing uh, in, in in itself, and uh, uh, it's very important. You have told about uh, the cross border status because I think artists are always uh, the ones that uh, transcended uh, borders in all ways so uh, they can help us to build uh, a strong Europe. So that's why this issue is so important. And thank you very much for our exchanges. So uh, Eben, thank you very much for your question. As you said, it's a, a very important um, organization. And I'm sure that a lot of representatives of the collective management uh, organization are listening to us today. Um, there are today a big part of the cultural ecosystem and uh, uh, heritage of history as they have existed uh, since the 18th century. We have a, a long history and in, in France I've seen some documents uh, from the SACEM, uh, you know, it's very interesting to see to, and it's moving too, I think. Uh, the fact that they still exist today show that they are uh, very resilient and uh, useful too. Uh, they are useful because they permit some solidarity among hotels and uh, during the crisis. You have seen it uh, in the, the, these uh, last uh, weeks and they can ensure revenues of, of the artists. Um, the organization have strongly helped authors uh, during the crisis as they have developed some uh, funds and uh, helped directly the authors. They are also the best platforms to fight a fair, for a fair remuneration against uh, the platform and we work very often together. Also, uh, they are very useful. They can act as advocates to, for uh, the struggle of artists in the European and uh, in a transnational way. They've been on very fight, on every fight, copyright, AVSM, to protect the artist's interest. And I have no doubt that they will continue to do so. We have uh, in the next few days, a very important text, the Digital Services Act. And I've no doubt that we will uh, go on and continue to work together on this, uh, uh, on this text and that we'll, they will be very attentive. So this uh, system of uh, solidarity is, to my view, 
a very good system as we've seen it's from uh, uh, three uh, uh, centuries now um, and I uh, encourage them very much to continue and I think it's uh, very uh, they have very good initiatives thank you thank you Laurent um, I'd like to, to raise another question um, and in late November the European Commission and the stakeholders published uh, the study, the status uh, and working conditions of artists and cultural and creative professionals. Uh, among the general uh, recommendation of the study to improve the status and the working conditions of the sector, there is a call uh, for policymakers and stakeholders to mitigate the effects on society where uh, self-employment uh, is becoming more and more prevalent and standard employment relationships are changing by taking the necessary measures to protect uh, workers. I'd like to, to ask uh, from this point to my colleague Niklas in five minutes uh, as well, uh, in your point of view, uh, in your role as legislator, what can be done to ensure that those who work on a project on, or on an uh, other unconventional, unconventional basis have access to appropriate and fair employment and labor rights? Yeah, thank you very much, Ivan. Very good question. And it, it, I think it, it comes a little bit together to the previous questions as well. And so I want to, to react on this, this as well. Um, first of all, I think that um, we need to, to ensure a certain safety. Uh, for everybody who's working. And uh, what we do in, in general working um, conditions uh, is that you have a mandatory minimum wage um, in many countries. Basically, in every country in Europe, we have a minimum wage. It's differently everywhere, and we need to see to, to, um, to even it out a little bit. But um, generally, you have one. You don't have that for self-employed people because, obviously, they can um, negotiate their own contracts. But here's the question. Um, when you are a small starting musician, you basically start to take every gig that you can get. And sometimes that, and I know that a lot of people know this situation, you, you take a gig for free drinks, if even. Um, so this is not fair remuneration. Um, and this continues. As a young actor, you probably force yourself into um, lower wages than, uh, than, than you normally do or you should do because you also don't just need to survive the next month. You also need to um, take some money back and put it in in, um, in in reserve for your for your age um, and so on. So we need to ensure that we have um, a minimum contract right. Um, I think uh, so. We need to look at how can we ensure that these contracts um, are evenly proportionate. And usually we say, okay, contracts are free. However, we also already see that if you look at, for example, um, housing rights, there contracts are also bound to certain standards because we know that we have a disproportionate um, leverage from, from one side. The host owner is always in a better position than the one who wants to live there. Um, and so therefore we should see if we can do something similar here. The other thing um, is social security net. We have one in France, we have one in Germany I know of, um, and that's um, I think almost it. And where we have them, they're maybe not even completely um, enough. Um, I know of, of people from Austria who, who, um, who are artists who, who did great art, um, who are now the, the shining star of Austrian art scene um, or um, are a part of the Austrian national heritage um, and now are having a, a um, pension of maybe 200 euros. And that brings me to the question that you asked previously, and that is about a collective uh, society man um, uh, management. Um, sorry, collecting management societies, um, that if they should be mandatory. And I think um, we have them mandatory in Germany and that works out quite well. And so far, I always think of, it's not good to, to give something mandatory and to, to have somebody to join a club. But as we see at the moment, this, the, the, this the fragmentation of the cultural sector is really a very big problem that we handle as politicians because we always need um, 
it's easier for us to to present somebody represent somebody if they have one voice and you know we go to our colleagues i know that maria goes to her colleagues in the college and needs to fight there as well and it's easier if you have backing of let's say the whole combined automobile industry then um tens of thousands of artists who have different organizations that therefore this is really helpful and i also know that a lot of artists who are in the um in the managing uh, authorities that they are very happy that they have a partner at site and at least in germany i know that they help also in the crisis quite a lot so maybe we can combine these thoughts and there's a lot of um, stuff to think about and i'm very happy that we have this study i uh, thank you very mar much maria um to to deliver on this and i know that we need to continue this discussion in the future um, with the cult committee with the commission also with the member states but there is so much need to be done because what we want to ensure in the end i think is that the descendant of europe diver uh, united in diversity can stay strong in the future and that means that we have a, a, di a diverse uh, cultural field Thank you, thank you, Nina. Can uh, I react to that just very, yeah, yeah. very quickly? I, I know that, that you yeah, have, uh, first, uh, first of all, I would, like to, I would like just to be very brief. Uh, thank you very much, Niklas, for your strong messages because I, I, I fully agree that so here we are on the same line. But just, just two sentences on the study. Uh, now the study is only the departure point. Uh, I would like here to, to say that this study uh, is carried out in close collaboration with several sec sectoral stakeholder organizations, such as the Culture Action Europe, the International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts, On the Move, or Pearl. Uh, but as I already said, it, it's a departure point under the work program for culture 2019-2022. An open methods of coordination expert group on the topic will start its work in 2021 and will continue our work on employment conditions through our Voices of Culture structured dialogue with the sector, in particular with the dialogue meetings with civil society. So just to tell you that in 2021, this topic will stay on our agenda. And of course, I count on you to continue with concrete ideas, concrete initiatives, step by step to see how we can achieve better results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I know that you're, you're uh, so run short of, of time, uh, but I, I'd like to, to make you a, another last uh, question because there, there, there's something that concerns me a, a lot, and it's about the, the situation of uh, uh, music live performance. Uh, are, are you trying to plan uh, something to, to, to support the, the efforts of, of member states in, in order to support the situation of this performance? Are you uh, thinking about some uh, tool that could, could be fit uh, to, to this purpose? Well, first of all, uh, we launched a call of two and a half million euros for, for the sector, and that's in the framework of Creative Europe. Now, I think that the first thing is that with the, the increased budget of Creative Europe, we'll continue definitely to, to support uh, our, our to support the, the sector. So for, for us now, what is important is to see how after the lessons learned from COVID-19, we can better support the sector because we all know that there is some very difficult moment for them. That's why you touch so different issues about the remuneration of authors, about the content and the, the link with the platforms. So I think that the next few, few weeks, it will be quite important to see not only what we can do with, with our Creative Europe program, but what we can do with other instruments. And I'm talking here, of course, with Horizon Europe and the Innovation, European Institute of Innovation and, and Technology. So what my plea here is don't hesitate to come to us with ideas, because what we have seen that the sector is extraordinary rich and they are innovative. I'm thinking that the music sector was uh, for me the first one that said very clearly that the Green Deal is, is a priority and they have already a concrete initiative on that mu music declares emergency. So now that the question is what's about the next, the next steps and how to join better our forces. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I'm absolutely sure that many 
uh, many people, so much people here are taking note of, of your words and uh, please uh, don't, 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 uh, don't forget about the, their situation, I'm, I'm sure uh, it won't be, be, be so. Uh, we are finished, finishing our time. Uh, I'm, I appreciate uh, your comments. I, the presence of uh, you, uh, Commissioner, is uh, very much appreciated by, by us. Uh, I think it's, it's the first step uh, to uh, cooperation uh, in, in the future. Uh, and uh, now it's time to conclude uh, our panel and move on to on the next uh, section of the program. I thank you again all for your participation and return the control of the meeting to our even to our moder moderator. So, uh, Alexis, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Go uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Ibdan. As the Commissioner Maria Gabriel said, um, cultural and creative, uh, creators, uh, creative um, sectors can be the driver of uh, innovation in Europe. Let's stay together and support the sectors. They need us, we need them. And of course, only together we can go further. Thank you very much. Commissioner Gabriel and uh, all MEPs participating in uh, the panel. Uh, Ivan Garcia de Blanco, Laurence uh, Farang, and Nicholas uh, Nenias. Now we move to the Q&A uh, section. As I said before, we will try to answer today uh, as many questions as possible. And uh, for the rest, we will come back to you at a later stage. I would like to mention that uh, on many aspects of your questions, the CCFG does not have a common uh, position. Um, so uh, the MEPs are speaking for themselves. So here we go with our uh, first uh, question. Is there a discussion for systems to support performing arts in time of the COVID-19 lockdown in the EU level? MEP Irena Jovova is here with us and you have the floor. Irena. Hello. Yes. Hi. I'm sorry. Uh, technical yeah. issues. I hope you can hear me and see me. Hello, everyone. First of all, um, I would like to say hello, of course, to all of the attendees and to all of my colleagues. And of course, uh, also to the commissioner, special thanks. Um, we are very honored that you took the time to be, um, to be here with us. It was a very interesting panel and the discussion before that. Um, so I will uh, try briefly to, to answer to this question. Uh, by the way, my name is Irena Joveva. I come from Slovenia, just so you know. Uh, so. To answer the question, um, we all know that uh, many of cultural workers, including uh, the performing arts, are self-employed and they are um, precarious or worse. So this is, of course, their nature of the work, but the outbreak of the pandemic particularly threatens the, the future of all the artists, while member states' measures are not always fair and proportionate to cover uh, all the needs. So on top of that, the member states measures differ from uh, country to country. So that's probably the biggest um, issue here because some countries have installed specific measures to mitigate damage from COVID for cultural workers, for example, Germany, uh, but others such as Slovenia, my country, unfortunately, hasn't. But the EU as such has, uh, as you know, loosened the state aid rules, released and loosened the unused structural funds, enabling member states to take advantage of this uh, full flexibility. And also uh, we have the sure guarantees that can be used to tackle uh, this issue. However, spending of these funds is in the competences of the member states. Although the commission made clear guidelines to protect the most vulnerable, including the performing artists. But 
it all depends on the on the member states measures. Uh, so Commissioner Gabriel announced already some, some time ago possible medium and long term measures targeting the CCS within Horizon 2020 cluster two uh, on culture. And then we have the Creative Europe facility, which was substantially increased uh, because of the pressure from us from the European Parliament, um, although the funds are admittedly still too low to to solve to solve this issue uh, within the creative europe program the commission also called for a uh, redirection of funds towards virtual mobility and digital culture for a two uh, two million euros call for projects in may 2020 in a support scheme for um for cross-border dimensions in performing arts we are also debating on enhanced uh, use of the cultural and creative sectors uh, guarantee also for uh, performing arts. So we, the CCFG, uh, have also pushed for national plans for the RRF facility to have a 2% mandatory allocation for culture sectors, which Niklas already talked about. Um, so uh, the next goals for the Commission and also the European Parliament will be to um, to push more targeted support measures and ways to adapt um, existing programs to offer more more specific support and um, for the cultural sectors and artists that are um, that are most affected. So I would say that the EU as such is trying to create an appropriate framework and clear guidelines, but the major decisions for social affairs are still within the member states. And within them, there are major differences, while the EU funds are still limited to tackle the, the social crisis of cultural workers in this time, um, this times. So I hope I answered your, your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Irena. Um, MEP Hans uh, Heide, I would also like to answer this question. Hans, would you give us uh, your comments on the same question? So I'm, 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 I'm trying to work out that you can see me. So hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I think Irena has given the right answer and covered all the important questions. But maybe I could take up the opportunity to switch uh, to the to the competence of the European Union uh, for culture and to the cultural deal for Europe that has been mentioned in other questions, because I think it's directly, I think it's directly connected uh, with a follow up of the COVID-19 crisis, because this crisis uh, showed very clearly or made aware how important the cultural and creative sector is. We have heard it already this morning. There are nearly 9 million people uh, oc uh, occupied, employed in the cultural sector, and that's uh, nearly 4% of the overall employment in the European Union. And this sector is hit worst by the crisis. And it's impressing, and um, you will be surprised when you hear that culture is not part of the strategy Europe 2020 for growth in employment. And this should give us the opportunity to make clear how important uh, culture, the cultural and creative sector is for Europe, for the economy. And uh, it should play a part and a role in the discussions we will have on the conference uh, of, um, of future of the European Union of Europe and uh, to, to uh, talk about uh, cultural deal for Europe. And uh, for me, it's uh, the, the European policy, the core is the cohesion policy. I always say this is the heart of the European policy, of European politics, but culture and education should be the brain of the European politics, and we should do it with passion. And there is so much more to do because imagine the only designed European form for culture is Creative Europe. And the program has uh, an amount of uh, 209 million euro per annum for 28 member states and eight associated uh, countries. 
and this is this amount is the yearly running cost of the uh, Opera House of Paris. So we need an increase of all the funds. We need not only specialized funds for culture and the creative sector. Your, uh, the culture should also play a role in other European funds. And we did, as uh, parliamentarians, I think a very good job um, to help to, to raise the amounts for Erasmus Plus, for Creative Europe and other funds. But we also have to raise the percentage for the, for the projects when they uh, are going to be realized. This will also be our work. It will be our work to take part in the, in the, in the discussion of the, in the conference uh, on the future of, of Europe. And uh, we have to also take care that there is a coordination of the other European funds with investments in the cultural sector. And even in the in the resilience fund, in the recovery and resilience fund, at the beginning there was uh, culture didn't play any role. So we, as a friendship group, it's our part to bring uh, culture in the center of European politics, and there is a European cultural policy. And I think um, this group, this friendship group, has shown what it can deliver. And we will hard work on this. And I appreciate the idea of a cultural deal for Europe. And it needs also the support of all the cultural institutions, for all the of all the cultural workers, and of course of the civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes and uh, Irena. Uh, you have very interesting uh, input. Uh, now we're going to our, our next question. There is about uh, asking for support so that books for children can be read by blind and normal sighted children. MEP Romeo French, have the floor. <coughs> Romeo, are you here? Can you hear us? Maybe we have a problem with uh, Romeo and his uh, connection. So we should uh, move um, to the next uh, question. Uh, moving forward then to the next question um, is, what will be the CCFG contribution to improve rights of freelance and self-employed in the creative industries? MEP, uh, Shuchana, Shukana, uh, Glavak, um, we'll have the floor. Is uh, Shukana here? Okay. Hello, how are you? Now, do you hear me now, Alex? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex, and uh, I would like to thank Commissioner Gabriel for being us uh, today. Dear Friends of Culture, we are all very happy to finally uh, be able to present you the work and the future plans uh, of CCFG. I would like to thank also our stakeholders, and I'm glad that we have Croatian colleagues uh, today with us. Uh, cultural and creative sector and, and industries are some of the most affected sectors by the COVID-19 crisis while accounting for approximately uh, 7.8 million jobs and 4% of our GDP. Uh, this is why it is uh, of utmost, utmost importance to find solution and uh, use the instruments which would uh, further support the CCS in uh, these challenging times and help their recovery. As already mentioned, uh, the European Parliament strongly supports CCS in its resolution uh, on the cultural recovery of Europe from in which adopted the position to have 2% from the RFF uh, for CCI and we defended that position by sending a letter uh, to the negotiators in which we underlined the importance of it. It is necessary to mention uh, the Creative Europe program, a crucial program for our next seven year period that was increased by 0.6 billion euros after the November MFF agreement. The total budget of the program is now more than 2.2 billion euro. 
uh, with uh, with our uh, work um, and our actions with the CCFG, we will keep insisting on a further improvement and positive changes uh, for the CCS. I would like to continue with our questions. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Stadinger, on question. How CCFG plans to improve uh, rights uh, of freelance and uh, self-employed uh, in the creative industries? This topic was discussed by the minister responsible for culture uh, of the member states two days ago, as already mentioned by Commissioner Gabriel. It was pointed out that given the expected adoption of the MFF and the implementation uh, of the RFF, it is necessary to ensure the availability of relevant European financial assistance programs for the culture and creative sector and to be uh, able, sustainable and resilient system for possible further future crisis and extraordinary circumstances. In our working plan, we have uh, stated that we work on the implementation of the current EU uh, leg legislative uh, framework and other agreements aimed at improving the contractual position of authors and performance and ensuring adequate protection of individual creators, including freelancers and uh, self-employed, and we will remain committed to that goal. We can also mention uh, the situation in which a large number of cultural uh, content begin to be shared online, further indicating the need to uh, for better copyright protection, ensuring uh, fair uh, compensation for authors and performers, more precise regulation and promoting digital and uh, media literacy. Now um, we need to, uh, to focus on the future. The, uh, the recovery plan includes the culture sector and it will activate uh, the entire sector by reviving economic activities. I believe uh, that uh, with this meeting today, we are reaffirming our support towards our artists, freelance authors, performance and other creators. And this is uh, just our first step together uh, within the CCFG. It is fulfilling to see so many participants today. And I want to underline that this is a necessary step towards a stronger voice of the CCS in the EU. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, and thank uh, for everything, what you do. Thank you very much, uh, Shunkana. Um, uh, I'm trying to pronounce your uh, name uh, uh, right. <laughs> like it's, Shunkana Lab, right? It's like a son. It's like a son. Sunny. Ah, son like Chai. a son. Shunkana. Son. Yes. All <laughs> right. Thank you very much for uh, your input. Now, uh, we're going to the next question. Uh, what are your views on the invest EU's ability on build on and hopefully scale up the work started with Creative Europe's cultural and creative sectors guarantee facility? MEP Marcos Ross Sempre, you have the floor. Hello. 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 Many thanks for this question. Uh, firstly, I would like to mention the definition made by the Council Resolution for the purpose of this program. It says that the InvestEU Fund will act as a single European Union investment support mechanism for internal action, replacing all existing financial instruments. So uh, it goes on and finally says that thereby addressing market failures and suboptimal investment situations that hamper the achievement of European Union goals. So in, in, we know that your letter signed by 26 organizations from across Europe's cultural and creative sectors sent to European commissioners Terry uh, Breton uh, and Paolo Gentiloni uh, regarding this program. We, as all of you, want you the European Union to ensure that the cultural and creative sector will benefit from an appropriate level of support via InvestEU. In addition, we welcome the increased achieve in the last in the latest negotiations. We have resulted in an interim agreement increasing this program by a further one billion euros. We also very proud. Uh, of 16 million increase in the Creative Europe program. The previous cultural and, cre and creative sector warranty facility 
benefited small and medium sized enterprises active in the cultural and creative sectors in the European Union. From my point of view, Invest EU must continue this previous work to ensure that small and medium sized enterprises are not left behind and receive adequate uh, support. Regarding uh, the role of Invest EU, it must include all of these little finances programs under one roof. In its communication of June uh, 2018, the Commission placed this program under the umbrella. And we are convinced that within the four areas proposed, cultural creators will have their place above all in projects related to research, innovation, and digitalization, the financing of small business and investment in projects related to social issues and skills. This is my opinion. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Um, as we said, we're trying to cover as many questions as possible, so we're moving uh, very fast uh, forward for the next question. Europe's wider cultural community released a joint statement calling for a cultural deal for Europe. What joint action with CCFT is to be expected? MEP Dominic Reef the Devesa, please uh, come on stage and take it. Hi, how are you? Thank you. I'm very well. How about you? Thank you. To, <laughs> good to see you, uh, Alexis. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to answer this, this question. I also like to congratulate um, Isabel, um, I heard that uh, they had a very successful event, uh, which I could not attend uh, due to, to our parliamentary duties. And I could not agree more with you, Alexis, and, and with colleagues that we need a, a renew, um, a renew uh, vision for culture in Europe, no? what I like to call with others the, uh, the, new, uh, the new cultural deal uh, for Europe. Um, regarding the, um, the driving principles for this new cultural deal, uh, from the statement, I like to highlight uh, three ideas. No? Uh, first, you, there is a call in the statement to call to work transversally. Of course, culture can contribute to almost all areas of activity of the union and all areas, all areas of uh, Union action have an impact on culture. Uh, and this is, by the way, what you find in the treaty in Article 167, Paragraph 5, when it states that the Union shall take, cult take cultural aspects into account in its action under other provisions of the treaties. So this is very important. So the transversality is already there in the, in the treaty. Probably uh, the Union has not been um, effective in making full use of this treaty um, provision. Now, uh, regarding, uh, for example, the Bauhaus initiative, we can consider this a small step in this direction, uh, but going back to the spirit of this treaty provision, we have to make sure that the Bauhaus is mainstream across different programs and funds uh, to, allow, uh, to, allow, to, allow, uh, to allow artists and workers to build a true bottom-up European movement that puts culture at the heart of the European Union project. So in my view, we cannot be limited to construction or architecture, right? Cinema, writing, uh, theater, all of this has to be included, I think, in, in this initiative. Uh, now, we have also a call to take into account culture in the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, which for me, it's very important because from, from my work in the Constitutional Affairs Committee, I follow very much this, this process. And I think we need a, a, a deep discussion on culture in this conference precisely because traditionally it has, it has not featured in, in, the, in the main policy priorities of the European Union so far. Um, so I, I think um, we, we can have this reflection also in order to strengthen the European dimension of culture, uh, in order to have 
I would say, a, a stronger legal basis for action in this field in the treaty. And of course, uh, we have to make sure that civil society organizations are included in particularly those coming from the culture and creative sectors in the conference. Um, because there is a lot of emphasis of involving the citizens in the conference, uh, but we cannot do that uh, and uh, not uh, with, with, we cannot do that by losing focus on civil, so on, on organized civil society, no? Uh, then, um, I think, I have another question, but I haven't been to maybe ask about it. Um, I have another question on on the future of the European framework for working conditions. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? And, um, please go ahead if you like. Um, okay. Okay. Tell us about no. It. So it's a, it's a different point, but maybe I just uh, quickly quickly say it. Um, that um, we are precisely uh, um, starting to work on a non-initiative report in the CULT committee on this uh, European framework for working conditions. This has been an issue before uh, we know of, of the precariat, if I can call it that way, that is very prevalent, unfortunately, in the cultural and creative sectors. But of course, the pandemic has made this even more problematic, no? Um, of, um, of more acute. Uh, so we need to focus on the question of earning a minimum income and on the question of collective bargaining, no? uh, which is not um, very, very much um, in the agenda. Um, and we know the, the problems of, um, that, that comes um, lack of collective bargaining because then you have poor job quality, low income, limited social protection, uh, leaving aside the question that most of them are, or many of them are self-employed, but still. Um, so um, I, I think um, this is um, mm, the, the agenda we have to fight for, no? Uh, to sum up uh, the um, the the um, having a European a, a, a big European initiative on on culture, this uh, cultural union or or um, new cultural deal, and uh, the question of the working conditions for for the workers in the cultural and creative sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for your comments in the chat uh, about our children's uh, book. Let's see the question again. The question about children's book. Uh, the question is about asking for support so that books for children can be read by blind and normal sighted children. MEP Romeo France is here with us. And Romeo, you have the floor. Thank you, Alexis. I like the idea to develop books for both normal sighted uh, children and visually impaired and blind children. I would like to know more about this project and we could analyze how we could bring it to the parliament and to the EU level. I am thinking of the possibilities of a pilot project or to see if the Creative Euro program could eventually support such a project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Romeo. And um, the way that uh, you uh, uh, gave uh, the question is uh, very unique. Thank you for very much for that. We're talking about uh, culture, so we have to be innovative, innovating and uh, inspired. So we're going uh, now to the next question. Uh, how will the CCFG support cultural relations? Um, how will it strengthen culture as a pillar of the EU's external action? Irena Jovova. Hello, once again, from floor. my side. Hello. Thank you, Alexis. 
Um, well, um, I think that we have all joined this friendship group mainly because we are, of course, very, uh, very fond of culture and we appreciate and uh, recognize its value. And as a group, we are, of course, different individuals, but we have a common goal. And we cre created this group as a platform to, to exchange ideas and support the creative sector also with this pandemic that um, has hit the cultural sector uh, so hard. And this is why we, as, um, as policymakers, can use platforms like this and events like this um, and you know, together identify where we can react and write letters and create actions and raise awareness and so on. And I would I would say that we are actually a very well connected group that can you know provide space to events like this one today. And um, I just like to say that this is just the start I think of our real work uh, because I'm sure that in the future we will also have more specific the more uh, thematic related issues and we'll work on various fields where we see our support and where our uh, voice is needed. And we're actually uh, already working on concrete issues. Um, we all talked about it before and you could all, all hear uh, a lot of um, concrete things. And um, each of us will also like kind of specify in some of the themes and problems and we will definitely uh, be loud and we actually already are loud until now. And as I said, we just started, um, you know, we wrote letters to the commission and to the public already. And we had some campaigns. You saw the videos, you saw the working plan, um, the strategy and everything else. So in short, I think that we can and will be the voice that's speaking up for culture and our, um, our cultural creators on, on the European level. Thank you very, very much, uh, Irena. And now we are going uh, towards to our last but not least uh, question. Uh, we need to, at some point, you know, finish um, uh, this um, action. So, what do you think about the unwaverable uh, right to appropriate and proportionate remuneration? Amy B. Marcus Roth Semper is taking the floor. Marcus, the floor is yours. Many okay. thanks for this question. Uh, firstly, I, I would like to remark that all the workers from all the sectors must have this right properly covered, receiving an appropriate remuneration according with their work. Since uh, 2014, this challenge about a uh, fair remuneration of creators has been addressed with others at the European Union level. Since the economic crisis, additional funding has also been made available for the sector via the European Fund for Strategic Investment introduced uh, by the Juncker Commission in 2015. As indicated in, in a 2017 European Commission uh, communication on the role of cultural and education, the synergies between the socioeconomic aspects are to be enhanced. Furthermore, in this in its communication of a new European agenda for culture of May uh, 2018, the European Commission expressed its disposition to foster a favorable environment for the cultural and creative industries and to ensure fair remuneration for authors and creators in the digital single market strategy. And also the copyright directive adopted in, in March uh, 2019 by the European Parliament and the Council after long and heated debates aims to secure creators income from their work made available on internet platforms without affecting the rights of those interested in accessing this uh, content on, on, online. Uh, the intention is that by protecting creators' remuneration, the diversity of European cultures will also be protected and the European Union citizens will be free to access and contribute to this cultural diversity. Finally, mention that in the resolution approved on the Parliament on 17th of September uh, 2020 on the cultural recovery of Europe, 
we called for direct and swift support for the cultural sector, arguing that financial aid should come from both national budgets and European Union funds. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for your um, answer. Now we are going further, and I have to admit that uh, I lied. We have one more uh, question submitted from the audience during uh, this event. Is the CCFG going to work at integrating culture with the scope of EU uh, competence? Isn't action in this field difficult since culture is not a, compet uh, a competence of the EU as such. MVP Hannes Heide has the floor. Hannes, are you here with us? Yeah, here are. I'm working. I'm working it out. Uh, I have to say that I answered this question already because I see it as uh, one of the follow-ups of the COVID-19 crisis, that this has to be a reaction. And uh, as I said, the, the importance of the sector and the huge amount uh, of employment uh, that was not uh, aware in the, in, uh, the broader, uh, broader um, um, that the people were not aware of it. So this is a big uh, opportunity and there will be this conference uh, on the future of Europe and we as a friendship group uh, will participate and bring culture right into the center of European politics. That's what I wanted to, to, to say and we will do it with passion and uh, all the uh, people that are working in the creative sectors can be aware that we will be a very strong force in bringing up this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Hannes. Now, um, we are going to close the event. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you also for your understanding for any technical troubles. Uh, it happens when it's live. It's like real life, you know. Uh, to sum up, in uh, CCFG, uh, we join forces to support the cultural creative sectors. Today, Commissioner Maria Cabriel said that we are in this together. We are here to speak out for culture and we promise to do our best. So the CCFG will keep fighting for the best of the cultural and creative sectors. As I said before, we need us and they need them and we need them. Uh, we are about to finish, so it was uh, the CCFG live. Let's keep in touch until the next time. Thank you very much. Go for culture. Thank you, bye.